And this is what brings us to the part of the discussion about the design pathway forward. In the presence of such overwhelming complexity, what do we do about it? How do we manage it? How do we create resilience in the face of such incredible risks? The answer, at least initially, may be deceptive. The initial answer is to know that every one of these things occurs in a place. And so it's very important to know where you are. And right now, those of us in Toronto are right here. You can see that we're right there just above Lake Ontario in the North American continent. Now, why does it matter to know where we are? Because from where we are, we can create a tapestry of collaboration, a framework of partnerships and alliances that enables us to manage systemic risk together. And that's what we're going to talk about now. What is the role of a regenerative bioregion in tackling systemic risk? And part of it is to see that landscapes already organize themselves. They're already organized by the movement of water. This is a visualization of all of the river systems on the continent of Africa. So if someone was to ask, how do we regenerate and create systemic health for the entire continent of Africa? That seems absolutely overwhelming. But if you were to say, I am on this tributary of this river system that is one of the several hundred rivers of the African continent, then you could see that if every river was to restore its holistic health, that each place is a place from which to begin, that in parallel, we could move across the continent and regenerate the health of the entire continent. So the role of regenerative bioregions is to take the level of human culture that has been the most sustainable and integrated level of human culture, which is living within a landscape at a territorial scale with some degree of regional trade, which is how all hunter-gatherer societies have lived. And at that scale, we can see that there is like a patchwork quilt that can cover a network of landscapes to cover an entire continent. So the role of regenerative bioregions is to give us a holistic scale locally that we can organize ourselves around. And then to collaborate from one bioregion to another, we can move to higher levels of impact, such as regional or continental or even planetary scales. So if each bioregion is a whole system model for its own regeneration, it's an entire context for the life system of the population, then we could start to imagine a planetary network of human bioregions. And that planetary network is cultivating exchanges from one bioregion to another, sharing their learnings, engaging in trade, helping each other out to be able to regenerate their landscapes because everything is connected and interdependent within the earth. What we need to do is this. We need to recreate the conditions for living locally in terms of material flows, integrated life systems, and the thriving of families and communities. When you look at this map, which is colored based on ecotype, which means there are types of ecosystems that are constrained and largely determined by the types of soils, types of local climates, and type of ecosystems that exist within them that you can see that the local economies should be different in each place because they're different ecological contexts. So the idea here is that we can see how the land has already organized itself into watersheds and into ecosystem types, which means we can build from those and integrate with them to create sustainable local living economies. And this is an idea that is not new. In 1983, at the end of a 10-year period of very intense dialogue and intellectual debate about how human beings could live on a planet with planetary limits, there was a, a report that came out in 1983 authored by Dana Meadows, and several people were contributors to this essay. And when she, what she said was, she wanted to report on all of the learnings in 10 years of work with all of the major universities of the world to ask how could we live within planetary limits? And this is what came out. 
Vernon Rutten, who was an agronomist, said, each agroeconomic region is so unique that the concept of transfer of technology is irrelevant. What's relevant is the transfer of the capacity to develop technology and institutions that are consistent with the cultural endowment and resource endowment of each region. And then Dana Meadows went on to say, out of this came a vision of a number of centers where information and models about resources and the environment are housed. There would need to be many of these centers all over the world, each one responsible for a distinct bioregion. So this way of thinking about biological regions as the geography for creating sustainable economic systems and sustainable human cultures goes back many decades. If we start to think of a planetary network of regenerative bioregions, then we can see that by building strengths in a network of them enables us to create portfolios of our strategies where we might work across all of Central America or different bioregions that have similar types of landscapes. And this enables us to begin distributing the risk across this network of bioregions. It enables us to hold the diversity of projects and the innovation that comes from that diversity. It creates systems of collective learning where we can learn from one region to another how to do this deep, powerful, profound regenerative work. And it starts to build the infrastructure for bioregional economies as places that are further ahead help those that are further behind to catch up. And you can see this in the work that we're doing where I live. This is a map of uh, the, the country of Colombia. And what you see here are the mountains of the Northern Andes. The area that's there colored in in pink is a 500,000 hectare region that defines a regional climate system and a unique, ty unique type of ecology. It is the only high Andes tropical dry forest on earth. And it's also 95% deforested and rapidly becoming a desert. And we've been working in this region for several years with people who have been there for decades doing their own projects to create an integrated framework for the entire bioregion. And so here is a, just a little flavor of what we've been doing. What you can see here is a collection of local projects that have been unfolding within the territory around Barichara, Colombia. There are projects like Ojo de Agua, which is a community theater for teaching children about the story of their place and their history and to build up ecological knowledge and environmental connection. There are places like Casa Comun, which is creating a local economy and trade exchange for local producers who um, are farmers and people that create textiles and artists. People have various different things to contribute to the local economy. There are projects like Ori Hindalagua, which is a nature reserve, taking degraded land and restoring native forest. Projects like Agua Santa, which is a network of agroforestry projects for food security and food resilience, that's building and strengthening soils while restoring watersheds and creating food, food security for the region, and so on. There are actually about 30 projects that we're working with. And we're helping these projects to come together, organized within the landscape itself. The basic metaphor for what we're doing is that we think of the land or the territory as a bank for regenerative investments. And in conceptual terms, you can think of it this way. The land is what can retain water and build soils. It can train people and provide livelihoods. It can cycle nutrients and create material flows for the local economy and the local ecology. It can provide housing and grow food for the people who live there. And all of these things enable the land as a bank to grow the capacities of local economies and weave them with other landscapes. So in short, this is a portfolio approach. We gather together a collection of projects within a landscape, or we gather up a collection of landscapes to collaborate together. And then we set up collaborative processes to weave the new and the existing efforts around the goal of whole earth regeneration. One very powerful way to think about this is if you were to imagine having a bioregional investment plan for a platform for the landscape where you live. Imagine a portfolio of projects organized around a specific territorial landscape, and then you create robust circulation of values and benefits for the whole landscape by helping all of them to evolve together. Where we live in Barichara, Colombia, 
we're managing this by creating a community foundation that has a territorial focus. And it's interesting to know that the first community foundation ever created was in the 1920s in Cleveland, Ohio. And I, my understanding is that there's a foundation in Toronto, the Toronto Foundation, that's also a community foundation. So it's interesting to ask, could institutions such as these help to weave these local projects? Can local government do it? Can conservation planning authorities do it? Can local community groups do it? So that we manage and coordinate the learning up to the territorial scale. And so the way that I would say it is that there are four parts. You can see the little graphic here in the bottom. We have a territorial foundation, which just represents that there is governance for the collaborative process, however your territory might happen to do it. There's a bioregional learning center or a learning ecosystem. We have to share our learning and learn together to work at the scale of the entire landscape. And we do this with a portfolio of local projects, which grows, evolves, and changes with time. And then hidden within it, down in the middle of this image, is the pro-social capacities to collaborate and create and imagine and envision and navigate conflicts together to keep the whole system moving forward in the same direction. If you wanted to think of this in another way, you could imagine like this. Imagine if you had a dashboard for all of the information you would need to keep track of to follow a process like this where you would follow all of, all of the energy flows of the Earth system. There's rain and water, there's sunlight and energy, all kinds of things from the Earth. There are supply chains of human economies, the material flows within your territory and in the trade with other territories. There are nutrient cycles of the ecosystems and the landscape. And then there's the value creation that can occur by restoring the health and vitality and improving increasing and diversifying the quality of material flows, and that all of these could become integrated with each other at the landscape scale. Another way of thinking about this is that the portfolio approach allows you to manage systemic risk because you spread the risk out through a diversity of projects. You might have diversity in the different kinds of ecosystems and biodiversity that exists in different parts of your landscape. You may have different scales and complexity of projects, a small community garden or something that's restoring an entire watershed. You can have different cooperative structures and different regenerative goals. So you may have goals for restoring soil, for civic participation, for healing of cultural traumas, for decolonization and, learn and building better relationships with indigenous cultures. Whatever the regenerative goals may be, they'll each have their own cooperative structures. And a diversity of models means that you can experiment. Some will succeed and some will fail. And also you have projects with different stages of development. New projects that are just being imagined now, all the way through to projects that are decades old and that are very complex and mature. And this diversity held together enables you to create the resilience for managing systemic risk. So if you think about it this way, this Bioregional investment platform isn't simply a fund. It's actually a learning journey as everyone in the territory learns together how to work together, how to think and, and act together. And as they move toward their goals, they continually learn and share with each other. And they learn in a process of regenerative development, developing and shaping their economy, culture, and landscape around the living systems that are already a part of them. And they weave toward an integration at a platform scale so that they can have sustained ongoing collaboration. And this can allow us to restore planetary health. So the art and science of bioregions works like this, that each bioregion has an ecological boundary in which it lives. But for humans, it also has a cultural identity. And when you put these together, what emerges is a coherent story of place. Every living being on earth has a story of place. So the question becomes, do you know yours? Do you know your story of place? See, our personal stories are always connected to the reality that we exist somewhere. Our personal story is connected to where we are. And if we are born into a place, or if we migrate and travel and come to live in a place, we enter into a landscape that has a cultural history and an ecological history that is continually emerging in the present 
And as members of the community living in that place, we are part of that story. And we can live into and give birth to a bioregional future by shaping how that story unfolds through our individual and our collective actions. So now let's go back to Toronto. In Toronto, you have a very special landscape. I was born in Missouri in the Ozarks, and we did not have anything like this giant sponge that you all have, which is the Oak Ridge Moraine. This is a sponge that was created over the period of two and a half million years as ice sheets ground up the rock to make gravel and sand. And just when I put on Wikipedia to learn about the Oak Ridge Moraine, I quickly discovered that it is the birthplace of 26 rivers, including the five watersheds that move from north to south across the city of Toronto. You have this very unique landform with an absolute embarrassment of riches for the water in your landscape. So the question becomes, if the greater Toronto area begins to take leadership and build its capacity for working in this integrated bioregional scale, how could they help create resilience with all of the interdependencies of the rest of the world? The answer is to see that there's a larger scale system that Toronto is embedded within. And as Toronto is doing this work, they can begin to weave the waters by collaborating with other watersheds and other water forms. So Lake Ontario together with Lake Erie, Lake Huron and the other Great Lakes. They could also work with things like the Finger Lakes in upstate New York or other interesting landforms where they're connected to Lake Ontario. They might find sister cities to collaborate with, like in Cleveland, Ohio, which is already working with the Legacy Project. And the Legacy Project is the work that Brian and Susan are doing, and they're working in the Toronto area. So how could the efforts for the bioregion of the Cuyahoga River and Cleveland, how could that collaborate with Toronto? And then, of course, you have the largest forest on Earth, the boreal forest to your north. So how could you move out into these larger landscape patterns and share your learnings and collaborate with other places? Maybe they can do things that your local economy can't do to be able to build systemic resilience at a regional scale. What's interesting about this is when we go back out to the size of the continent and look at North America, once again, the continent is defined by the movement of water. Just look at all those watersheds. And if you have people organizing in the Great Lakes as a network of local bioregions, notice what happens is you go all the way west in Lake Huron. And you get to the westernmost tip of Lake Huron and you're in Duluth, Minnesota. And Duluth, Minnesota is the birthplace of the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River covers 40% of the continental United States. It's a massive body of water connected to several river systems. So we could imagine this moving outward to create regional resilience for the Great Lakes and then collaborating with people up and down the Mississippi Basin. By the, by the way, the Ohio River comes all the way over through Pennsylvania into New York. The Missouri River goes all the way to Montana. The Arkansas River goes all the way to Colorado. The Mississippi River goes all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And those of you who know your regional history, the Algonquin peoples of Toronto traded and received seashells from the Gulf of Mexico and from the Atlantic seaboard because boats moved up and down the Mississippi River and across the Great Lakes. So there's actually a historical precedent of a 12,000 year period of stability for trade networks across the North American continent. And what I'm describing here is that this bioregional approach allows you to treat your local landscape holistically and help other landscapes to do the same and then collaborate across them up to the continental scale. If we create bioregional networks on every continent, this is how it is possible to regenerate the earth. So how might you imagine bioregional learning centers in the greater Toronto area? What would they look like? What institutions and capacities do you already have that are able to learn, think, and act in this way? 
Well, for what we're doing in Bari Char, just to give you a, an example of how to think about this, what we're doing in Bari Char, Colombia, is we've identified territorial patterns of regeneration that we're working with. I think these will all look familiar to what you're doing in the greater Toronto area. For one thing, we're focusing on the restoration of entire watersheds, setting up community water councils, member-owned aqueducts, and other ways of restoring the watersheds. We've created a learning center in Centropic Agroforestry to spread reforestation practices, to rebuild soils, and to create all the materials we need for a local economy. Because agroforestry systems can create textiles, medicine, food, construction materials. Most of the things you need for an economy can be grown in a forest. We're work is working on transforming the local food systems to be more localized and resilient. So we've, been, we've established a community market with local food growers. This is similar to the way that a farmer's market might work. And we're working on the design and experimentation for alternative economic models, investigations in solidarity and community exchange and keeping financial flows in the local economy and doing the opposite of what the global economy does, which is that outside investors invest in local places and then extract the resources and the profits. Bioregional models are about, about creating strong local and regional economies. A framework that can help us understand how to do this was developed by the Common Land Foundation. Common Land Foundation is currently working with 16 landscapes and a growing number. And each landscape is at least 100,000 hectares in size. And they work for at least 20 years. And they have a framework for integrated landscape management that they use to help them do this. We're adopting this landscape approach in our work in Colombia. And the way the framework works is like this. They call it the 54320 model. And basically they identified five processes for landscapes, which these processes need to run over a period of 20 years. One of them is establishing a landscape partnership that is then able to reach a shared understanding of what the landscape is, how it came to be the way it is, and scenarios of the future to move toward. And then there's a selection of a landscape plan. And then the landscape partnership ensures the effective implementation of the plan, and they develop continually improving monitoring and learning frameworks as they go. They're able to combine this with a very clear language for four different returns that they can talk about to investors to help them step into this process. So financial returns are present, but alongside them are natural returns, just ecological benefits, social returns, general improvement in economic and social well-being, and also the most profound of all, the return on inspiration and in storytelling, engagement, and participation. This approach also takes an understanding that the landscape can be divided into three different kinds of zones to create an integrated understanding of the landscape as a whole. There can be a natural zone, which is set aside for conservation, a combined zone where ecological benefits are being achieved while also creating economic outcomes. This might be regenerative agriculture or agroforestry as examples. And then that there can be an economic zone like the urban center that is able to densify and build itself in a more coherent way because of the transfer of development rights with the other zones. This model is really powerful because it is mirrored by the much more familiar large scale infrastructure project. So if you were to build something like a regional light rail system, you might find $2 billion, develop a 30-year plan, hire a project management team that then subcontracts out to lots of other groups, and then spends the $2 billion with all of the returns coming in over the period of 30 to 40 years. With that as a mental model, we can think of landscapes in the same way that there needs to be a core team that is setting up the landscape partnership and managing the landscape processes. Common Land Foundation has found that the core team needs to be funded at a level of about $2 million per year. But then there's a whole bunch of regenerative projects that are integrating and restoring the health of the entire landscape and building the regenerative economy. And they found that two to three times as much money per year needs to be invested in creating an ecosystem and an integration of these regenerative projects. Notice that this is that portfolio approach that manages systemic risk. 
And what they found in practice with the landscapes they've worked with is that regenerative economies really start to, to take hold and regenerative businesses become profitable about eight to 10 years into the process. And in their experience, local governments don't really understand this model until after it's been demonstrated and they don't start supporting this regenerative economy until it's starting to emerge. Now that can be leapfrogged by understanding the model and having seen it in other landscapes, which is what a lot of the work of the Common Land Foundation is right now. But the important thing to see here is that this is a way of managing a landscape fund that someone could invest $500 million in their bioregion, maintaining a landscape partnership with several landscape processes, funding the development of the innovation ecosystem for the emergence of a stable regenerative economy so that the regenerative economy generates the revenue returns, the tax base for the government, for the government to reinvest those returns back in the community as part of the ecosystem. And that this happens on a scale of at least 100,000 hectares or larger for a minimum of 20 years. This is a large scale infrastructure project and it has been demonstrated now in 15 landscapes by the Common Land Foundation. The work we're doing in Barichara is joining and becoming part of this group. And perhaps Toronto would be interested in the future. <laughs>